Hey, if that's not the church being the church, then I don't know what is. Can we show the pretty some love in the house one more time this morning? Amazing couple, amazing, amazing, amazing. Goodness, video got me. I'm about to turn into crybaby Gibbs up here. What's happening? Get yourself together, Joey. <laughs> Well, if you're new, uh, my name is Joey, and I want to welcome you. You picked a phenomenal day to be in church. We are in a fresh season of vision called Beyond. Let me hear you say Beyond. Beyond. Yeah, and um, if you're new to the conversation, let me show you what it is. Beyond is this movement where we're advancing now for generations to come. We're full of belief, believing that there are other communities who need people like the pretties. There are other cities that need churches like ours. And so we're going to advance now for generations to come. Don't you love how epic that sounds? This looks like a Marvel movie. I love it. Okay. But it's not a Marvel movie. It's about money. All right. So here, <laughs> beyond is a two-year journey of increased generosity to multiply our kingdom impact. It's going to be that kind of day, people, just so you know. Two-year journey of increased generosity to multiply our kingdom impact impact. The reality is, is that as God has expanded our vision, we know that it's time to expand our budget. And so let me show you the expanded vision that we believe that God is pulling and pushing us into. There's four parts of it. The first one is beyond church. Then it's beyond here, beyond now, and beyond us. And last week, Pastor Stephen, he took a deep dive into beyond church. And this week, I'm going to take a deep dive into beyond here. Let me see, let me hear you say beyond here. Yeah, and so for beyond here, we're gonna move beyond one location to five additional locations over the course of five years. Somebody say, wow. wow. It's a lot. I was gonna have at this point in the service, you turn to your neighbor and give each other a high five and say five for five locations in five, five years, but coronavirus. So <laughs> we won't do that, right? So no high fives, but we're gonna move from one location to five additional locations in five years. LifeWay Research recently did a study and LifeWay Research said that somewhere in the neighborhood between six and 10,000 churches in the United States of America close annually. That's somewhere between around 150 churches that close every single week. That's a crisis that's bigger than the coronavirus. That's an epidemic. I don't know about you, but I think about heaven a lot. And that may just be unique to me being a pastor, or it may just be unique to me being weird. But I think about heaven a lot. I think about that day when we're standing in eternity and Jesus opens up the book on Christian history and he reads for us this stat for all of us who are alive on planet earth during this period of time. And I just wonder, what are we gonna say? Like, what are we gonna say that that, when he tells us that that happened on our watch, that that happened while we were supposed to be leading the way? What are we gonna say? I can tell you what we're gonna say. We're gonna say we started five churches in five years. And then we're gonna say we started multiplying churches after that. We're gonna say we took the Great Commission seriously. We're gonna say that we went fearlessly, that we, made, we started a new wave of discipleship, that we went boldly, courageously, relentlessly, because Jesus came recklessly after us, amen? That's what we're gonna say, Stone Creek. And so, man, I've got all of this belief and all of this expectation for us to, to be able to do this, to see five new churches, five new locations started over the course of the next five years. And I know that five churches in five years, that might sound ambitious, but I'm here to tell you it's imperative. It's imperative. New churches, new campuses, and new locations meet, reach more new lost people for the kingdom than any other vehicle, than any other vehicle. And so we've got to go. And now let me tell you about these five churches. Okay. The first one is Elevate City Church. Okay. I don't know if you've heard or not, but we're launching a campus in the Sandy Springs location in August of 2020, and it's going to change that city. Okay. We believe it's going to wake a generation up to Jesus. But let me tell you about Elevate City. Elevate City is a campus of Stone Creek Church. We're going to be one church in two locations. We got different names, but we got the same heartbeat. Okay? This is one church, one vision, one staff, one leadership team, one organization, one budget. We are one church in two locations. Okay, uh, Elevate City is going to look and feel like Stone Creek. It's going to look a little bit more attractive because I'll be preaching every week. But, 
but it's gonna look like us, okay? Like, I don't know if this is gonna get like a cheer or a boo, but I'm not going anywhere, okay? Like, I'm still gonna be around. I'm still gonna be a part of the organization. I won't be around as much, but I'm still here, still part of this team, this family, this squad. We are multiplying our church in that location. It's gonna be beautiful. It's gonna be amazing. And I'm here to tell you, God is already blowing our minds at what he's doing at that campus, already blown our minds. At our last preview service, we're not even meeting regularly yet. We're just having preview services like once a month. At our last preview service, we had over 150 people show up. We've already got three small groups. Come on, come on. We've already got three small groups. And here's the best part. Already, just at preview services, five people have already given their life to Jesus Christ. Come on. Like we're already running out of space, okay? Like we're looking for a new building. So if you're in commercial real estate or you got hookups in Sandy Springs, I holla at your boy, okay? Because we're looking for some new space. Let, let me tell you this quick story, just a snapshot of what God's doing at Elevate City. I told this last week at Elevate City Nights, but you just gotta hear the story. It's so good. This is what's happening down there. Um, I had this couple come up to me last Sunday night and they said, hey, Joey, we just want you to know we're all in. We're all in. And I was like, okay, cool. Tell me more, tell me more. And they go, we want you to know that we've been trying to sell our house in Louisiana for a year, haven't been able to sell it. It's been on the market for a year. And we've been thinking about moving back to Louisiana. And I was like, good God, why would anyone do that, right? Um, but I kept that to myself. And then they answered the question. They're like, I, we don't wanna take a loss on our house. And so, you know, we were thinking about moving back, but we don't care about that anymore. We don't care about taking a loss on our house. We're gonna cut the price. We're gonna take a loss so that we can move to this city and be a part of this movement because we believe in it in Jesus' name. That's not normal. People don't do that. That's crazy, right? This is what they said to me. Y'all aren't ready for this. They go, hey, everybody's got different gifts in the kingdom to give, right? Everybody's wired differently. They have different gifts to give. Well, we're just gonna let you know that the gifts that we have to give is we've got time and we've got money and we're willing to give it. And I go, do you realize I'm a pastor? You just said you have money and a pastor. I'll take both in Jesus' name, right? Just both, I'll receive it in Jesus' name. Like that's not normal, but that is the way that God is blessing that campus because this is a culture worth being multiplied, amen? This is a church that other cities need. This is a movement other people need to experience and God is just getting started. It starts with Elevate City and Sandy Springs, but over the course of the next five years, we're gonna launch another campus in the metro Atlanta area. We don't know exactly where yet. We don't know exactly who's gonna lead that charge yet. We're raising up leaders. We are prayerfully considering. We're doing our research. Hey, if you're watching on Facebook Live right now, which some of you are, and you want us to come your city, let us know, comment, vote. We're taking options, okay? We'll see, we don't know, but we know that somewhere else in Atlanta needs another community of faith like this. We've got to multiply this movement. And so we'll be one church in three locations, one church in three locations over the course of the next five years. Now here's where it gets a little bit different. We're gonna launch Elevate City Belgium. Now for those of you who don't know, Belgium is less than 1% Christian. Of indigenous Belgians, Belgians less than 1% of them are Christians. Of the some 415 districts in Belgium, 360 of them have no functioning Protestant church whatsoever. It's a tragedy. And we want to step into that. Belgium leads the way in the secularization of culture. And we want to step into that with the love of Jesus and help launch a church. And so we've been partnering with a church called New Life Church in Belgium. They're probably watching online right now. Hey, can we all say hi, New Life on the count of three? One, two, three. They're gonna love that, okay? I'm gonna to talk to them later on and they're just gonna be so pumped that we did that. Um, but we've been partnering with them with this missionary couple by the name of Ty and Carolyn and they've been leading New Life. And with that partnership, we've been helping and supporting, but they're gonna help us launch Elevate City Belgium. We're gonna help with the staffing, with the resourcing and with the dollars and with pastoral training and strategy. They're gonna help with people and culture and context, work on the ground and language because your boy don't speak Flemish, okay? And so they're gonna help us multiply Elevate City Belgium. It's gonna be amazing there. The people to do it, believe in them so greatly. God's gonna do a great thing in Belgium. And then we're gonna launch a prison campus. So about a year ago, um, Stephen came to me and he said, hey, I feel like um, we as a church, we need to do even more for the poor and for the oppressed. And we need to start doing something for prisoners. And I was like, all right, we'll figure it out. And so the team and I, man, we got together and we started praying, we started research and we discovered this insanely cool ministry called God Behind Bars. And what God Behind Bars does is they help you live stream your service into a local prison. And so they would get to watch and experience our worship and our teaching, the things that you see on a Sunday. But then they would also help us place a chaplain in that prison, a chaplain who can do discipleship, 
a chaplain who can do pastoral care, a chaplain who can do counseling for the incarcerated prisoners. Now, here's where it gets really cool. They provide a platform so that as they're watching that church service, the people who are in prison, the people who are incarcerated, their family members can be watching the exact same church service. And there's a platform so that they can chat and communicate and dialogue so that those people in prison can still go to church with their family. And if that's not amazing, if that's not Jesus, I don't know what is, right? And we're gonna step into that. We're gonna go to the oppressed. We're gonna go to the forgotten. We're gonna go to the prisoner because that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus Jesus did. That's who Jesus is. And so we're going to start a prison campus. And then the fifth one is a compassion church in Latin America, a compassion church in Latin America. Now, Stone Creek, over the course of the years, we have sponsored more compassion kids, you're not ready for this, than any other church in the state of Georgia. That's where you cheer right there. That's amazing. We have had a heartbeat for the poor, a heartbeat for the oppressed, a heartbeat for the forgotten, a heartbeat to care for those who can't care for themselves in Jesus' name. Compassion is an unbelievable organization. Now the lid, the barrier to a compassion project getting off the ground, child sponsorship happening is a church. The thing we love so much about compassion is they only work through the local church because the local church is a hope for Jesus here on earth. And so where, when they wanna start a project, they've gotta find a church. And when they can't find a church, they can't start a project. And so now Compassion's getting in the game of starting churches. And we're gonna be partnering with Compassion to start a church in Nicaragua. We're gonna start a church there. We've already identified a location and a pastor, and we're gonna start a church in Nicaragua. And here's, here's where it gets really cool. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a Sunday where we get to sponsor all 200 kids who are gonna be a part of this Compassion Project. We're gonna get to sponsor them. And then you're gonna get an app where you're able to write letters to them, where you're able to provide birthday gifts for them, where you can share pictures with them, where you can keep them updated on what's going on in your family. It's gonna be so cool, but then it gets even better. Then we're gonna take trips there. We're gonna get on an airplane and we're gonna go on mission trips so that you can meet your compassion kid, so that you can get to know your compassion kid, so that you can disciple your compassion kid, so that your compassion kid can be a part of the Stone Creek story that is being written through you and me. How awesome is that? How cool is that? It's this beautiful bridge between justice and church planning that we've always wanted to see God do where we're able to care for the poor and we're able to see churches multiplied and he's doing it, he's providing the way. And over the course of the next five years, this is what we're gonna be doing. This is beyond here, moving from one location to five additional locations over the next five years. And I know what you're asking, you're going, gosh, how much money is that gonna cost? I'm so glad you asked. Over the next five years, beyond, all of beyond is gonna cost $10.25 million. $10.25 million over the course of the next two years. That's going to fund beyond here, beyond church, beyond now, beyond us. It's going to give us startup funds to move these things into the future, okay? And so this is a one fund campaign, one fund. Every dollar that's given over the next two years to Stone Creek Church, every step of generosity is going to beyond. It's going to fill these buckets, all right? And um, this is about twice what we would normally take in over the course of of two years, $10.25 million is, about twice what we'd normally take in. And so God has quintupled our budget or our vision, five churches quintupled, we need to double our budget, all right? And so we're gonna need to double our budget to be able to move into the future of seeing this happen and it's gonna be amazing. Who's excited about this? Who's pumped about this? Who's so honored to be a part of a church like this? Who's excited to be able to stand before the kingdom and say, that's what I was a part of. I love it. I'm so honored to be a part of this thing. It's gonna be amazing. All right, now here's what we gotta do. We gotta pray and ask God for a miracle because I got to preach a sermon in about 25 minutes and we all know that's almost impossible. Let's pray. Jesus, help, amen. All right, here we go. Here we go. If you have your Bibles, you can open them up to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter three. And what we're doing is we're using the story of Joshua to kind of frame out beyond. This is the book of the Bible that we're using for this vision series. And if you're new to Bible study, the book of Joshua tells the true historical account of the nation of Israel, God's people, journeying through the Jordan River and into the promised land. Now, if you were following the story or if you were to rewind 40 years, you would see that God's people made it all the way up to the Jordan River. They made it right before the promised land. And God actually wanted them to move beyond the Jordan and into the promised land, but they were paralyzed by fear fear. They let the obstacles that were before them be bigger than the opportunity that was in front of them. And so they settled for wandering, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. We can't let that happen to us, Stone Creek. We can't allow the obstacles that are before us to be bigger than the opportunity that's right in front of us. We can't let the obstacle of $10.25 million be bigger than the opportunity of all the people who don't know Jesus yet. 
We can't let it be bigger. We've got to let our faith be bigger than our fear, our belief be bigger than any barrier and step into the future that I believe God has right in front of us right now. These people started wandering because they didn't trust God. They didn't move forward. They didn't step in faith into the promise that was right in front of them. And so they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. For 40 years, these people are just walking in circles, walking in circles, chasing their tails, wandering in the wilderness. They're stuck. They're stuck. How many of you have ever been stuck before? How many of you have ever been honest before? Everybody's been stuck before. Everybody's felt like, man, I'm kind of wandering. I'm kind of stuck. Like I'm stuck in my marriage. Like, how do I get to this place where I just can't get any more intimate in my marriage? I'm, I'm stuck in my financial situation. I just, I'm stuck. I can't get out from under this debt. I'm stuck in my career. I'm stuck in my relationship with God. Like I can't get to know him better. I don't feel like I'm getting any closer to him. I'm stuck in my relationship with people. I don't feel like I've got deep friendships. I don't feel like they're growing. I just feel stuck. Have you ever been stuck before? I can tell you there was this time that I got stuck. Um, I was, went on this crazy trip with one of our missionaries, Katie Anderson, and Thomas Cheeseman, and we went to Indonesia, all right? And um, while I was in Indonesia, I had this brilliant idea, because that's what I do, is to uh, ride motorbikes in a foreign country, all right? And so I hop on these motorbikes, and we're riding them in a foreign country, and it's like there are motorbikes everywhere. It is very scary. And so I'm in Indo riding these motorbikes, and um, I've jumped out of an airplane before, multiple times. I want you to know riding motorbikes in Indo was more terrifying more terrifying. And so we're riding motorbikes and it's exhilarating and all this. And then we come up on this, like this point where there's clearly this like roadblock that's going on. And so this, uh, this roadblock's happening and they're pulling over all of these very white tourists and um, they're asking them if they had their passport. And guess what? I didn't have my passport. And so they bring me and Thomas back into this corner and they're telling us like, hey, like you don't have your passport. You're gonna go to prison for two years. You've got a court date, like say bye to your kids, holla. And all I'm thinking is like, I'm pretty. I'm not gonna do well in prison. In, you know, like it's not gonna work for me. And so like I have this conversation with them or whatever and they're like, oh, or, so what you can do is you can, you can pay us this, like you can give us this money and then we'll let you go free. And so then I'm stuck, I'm, I'm going like, so if I pay you, then are you gonna take me to prison for bribing a police officer? Like what is, like I'm stuck. It's like prison, a bribe, prison, a bri like I'm stuck. But because I'm a stone creaker, I paid them the bribe and went free, right? Cause that's how we roll. So I got out of that problem, but but I felt so stuck. And I bet that's how some of you feel today. You're stuck. You're like, I don't know where to go. I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do. I'm stuck. And the nation of Israel, they were stuck for years, but they've got an opportunity again to step into the promise. And the lesson that I think that we're gonna learn today is that although God requires something very small of you, it is not insignificant. There is a small step that is necessary for every single one of us if we wanna experience the promise that God has for us. And you're gonna see that that step today is a step of faith. Check it out. Joshua chapter three, verse one. Then Joshua rose early in the morning. How many of you know that men of God rise early in the morning? Men of God rise early in the morning. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of, prince of preachers, he said this. He said, um, I will not look into the eyes of any man until I first look into the eyes of my God. That blows my mind that he had such a commitment to wake up before anybody else did and to spend time with God before he spent time with anybody else. And it just paved out this amazing life for him. And this is the kind of man that Joshua was. He's the kind of guy who rises early in the morning and he sets out from Shittim. Now it's important that you pronounce that well in church. You know what I'm saying? You can say that the wrong way, get a lot of trouble, wind up on YouTube. All right, and they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it about 2000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go. For you have not passed this way before. So here's what's happening is they're camped out on the edge of the Jordan River. And then Joshua tells them, hey, when you see the Ark of the Covenant begin to move, I want you to follow it. Now, if you're new to Bible study, the Ark of the Covenant would have been this box that would have resided in the tabernacle, actually in the most sacred space of the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies. Let me just say Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was this one place that was reserved for the high priest once a year where he would go and make sacrifice and atonement for the people before God. And inside of this box, this Ark of the Covenant, which would have 
been ornate and designed and beautiful were three very significant historical artifacts for the nation of Israel. There were three things inside the Ark of the Covenant. First, there was the stone tablets that God had given the law to through the prophet Moses, um, the, stone, the stone tablets that had the 10 commandments on them. They were inside of the Ark of the Covenant. And then there was Aaron's staff. Aaron was the first priest and his staff was inside the Ark of the Covenant. And then there was this bowl of manna, this bowl of manna, which would have been like this bread substance. While the Israelites were wandering for the last 40 years. They were in the desert. And when you're in the desert, there isn't a lot of food. And so they were searching for food, but couldn't find it. And so God started to provide this manna and bowls from heaven. And so literally like they couldn't find food. They look up and all of a sudden it's rain and bread. Hallelujah. Rain and bread. Do you know I get it? Rain and men, rain and bread. All right. All right. All right. So, so then the manna was in there. So there's these three things that are in there. You're tracking. But then there was this fourth thing that was in there. And it wasn't a tangible thing. It wasn't something that you could see or touch. It was the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant symbolized the presence of God on earth. This is where God is. This is where God was. This is where God resided. This is where God was at. Now, why do I tell you this? Why do I explain this? Well, because the Ark of the Covenant is a precursor to Jesus. All of these things that are inside of the Ark of the Covenant can be found in the person of Jesus. Jesus is the only one who's fulfilled the law. He's the only one who's been innocent, the only one who's been without guilt, the only one who's been without shame. He's fulfilled the law. He's the great high priest. He stands in your place, makes mediation between you and God, offers sacrifice for your sins. And he's the bread of life. He meets all your needs. He fills you up when your cup is dry. This is Jesus. We don't need some box because we got a savior. How good is that today? That Jesus is the fulfillment of the Ark of the Covenant. And so, but for these people, they didn't have Jesus and they didn't have the gift of the Holy Spirit. So they just had to follow a box. And so Joshua says, wherever the box goes, you need to follow. This is God's invitation to follow him, to follow him. Now, now here's what I love so much is that God is inviting the Israelites to follow him, to say, wherever the Ark goes, you follow, which means he's going before them. Have you ever been afraid to go first? You ever been afraid to go first? Like, you ever been afraid to say, I love you first? Like that moment where you're like, I don't know if she's gonna say it back. Like, does she love me? I love her. I should love her. Will she say she loves me? You ever been afraid to say it? My wife and I, we always debate about who said it first, who said, I love you first. Um, true life, I've got a face mic. She can't, um, you know, combat this. She said it first. Um, it was one of those moments where like we were saying goodbye and she was like, all right, goodbye. Like, all right, we'll see you. I love you, bye. And she just says it. And that's the first time my wife told me she loved me. Just kind of like hugging goodbye. Um, but you ever been afraid to go first? You ever been afraid to try some food first? Like you look at something, you're like, that looks suspect. I don't, I don't know if I want to try that mystery meat, you know? You ever been afraid to go first? You ever been afraid to jump first, maybe off a cliff or off a diving board? Like, oh, I don't know what's down there. The great thing about God is that he always goes first. He always goes first. He loved you before you loved him. He created you before you knew him, before you ever thought he always goes first. He always paves the way. And there's this confidence that someone going before you instills within you. And God wants you to, for you to be confident, for you to know I've got it. I've walked the path. I've blazed the trail. I've laid it out for you. I've gone ahead. Every fear, every worry, every danger, I took it head on so you don't have to. Our God always goes first. There's nowhere that you're gonna step where, he not already, where he's not already at. Nowhere that you're gonna go where he's not already there. This is the goodness of our God is that he always goes before us. He was before us. He's already at Commitment Sunday. He already knows what's gonna happen. He's already in those five churches. He, he's already paving the way. He's walked before us. And any time in your life that you're afraid when God is asking you to do something, when God is asking you to move forward, what you need to do is you need to look back at the cross and you need to remember that Jesus went before you. He sacrificed for you. He gave it up for you so that you can move forward. He always goes first. I love this about our God. What confidence, what bravery, what boldness, what courage should we have to move into this new season where he's already at? I love verse five. I love verse five. Look at what Joshua chapter three, verse five says. Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I love that. Consecrate yourself for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. It's this idea of get ready because I'm getting ready. Get ready because I'm getting ready. Now, consecrate for many of us is this like weird biblical word that we're like, I don't know what that is. Is that like circumcision? Because I know that's weird and I don't want anything to do that. Well, let's consecrate. When you think consecration, I want for you to think preparation. 
Consecration equals preparation. The nation of Israel, the Hebrew people, they were a nomadic people, meaning that they moved around a lot. They went from place to place. They didn't have a homeland. They were foreigners in a strange country. And so nomadic people, because they're always on the move, they're always traveling. For the nation of Israel, showering wasn't real high on their priority list because they knew that they were just gonna have to pack up and sweat and move the next day. And so showering was never real high on their priority list. They were second cousins to middle school boys, okay? That's just who they were. It just wasn't real high on their priority list. And so consecration, what consecration is, is it's, it's setting something aside for a specific purpose. And it has this idea in it, consecration does, of washing, of becoming clean. So the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people, the only time that they would take showers is to get ready to become ceremonially clean to worship God. Their one time to take showers and to change their clothes was when they were getting ready to become ceremonially clean before God to worship. That's consecration. It has this idea of washing, of changing, take your bath, wash yourself, show me what you're scrubbing with, right? That's what the nation of Israel is doing in consecration. And I love it. Look at the scripture, put it back up there. It says that, so they have to consecrate themselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. So they have to take a bath, they have to go to bed, and then they're gonna move beyond. So this is where the world's first bed, bath, and beyond came from right here. So they consecrate themselves, right? They take this bath, they change their clothes. And it's got me wondering if consecration is preparation and consecration is taking a bath and changing your clothes and you gotta prepare before you step into the promise. What, God, what might God wanna change in us? What might need to change in you and me if we're gonna move forward into the promise that he has for us? What shifts might need to occur? I'm telling you, if we're gonna move beyond in the promise, there might need to be some changes in your finances. There might need to be some changes in your faith. There might need to be some career changes, some house changes, some lifestyle changes, some perspective changes, some value changes. And you see, I think we get pulled into this lie that somehow we can change and yet stay the same. You ever met somebody like this? He's like, yeah, I wanna change and I also wanna stay the same. It's like the person who's like, I wanna, I wanna lose weight, but I love Oreos, not gonna happen, not gonna happen. You gotta change if you wanna change. And if we wanna experience the promise, then we're gonna have to prepare. And part of that is gonna be changing. And so I'm just asking you, what needs to change for you to experience the promise? These people have to change and then they get to step into the promise. Watch what happens, verse seven. The Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters out of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Now, this moment would have been massive in the life of Joshua. I want for you to think about your idol for a second. Who's your idol? Whoever it is, just hold them in your mind. Like you're the person who you're trying to emulate your life after. For Joshua, it would have been Moses. Moses is Joshua's Michael Jordan. That's who he is. He's the guy who's done it, who's paved the path, who's carved out the, the, the lane. He wants to be like Moses. And so God's going, hey, I'm about to do in you what I did in Moses. What? Yes, please. But there's something super significant that you gotta see here. As soon as Joshua would have heard that, what he would have thought is I'm standing at water. Moses stood at water. And when Moses stood at water, he did something super significant. And you probably know this story. This is the last time that the Hebrew people came up to the water and, and, and they're leaving captivity from the Egyptians. They've been enslaved and they have broke free. And so now they're coming up to this water and the, all of the Egyptians are following behind them. And there is the Red Sea, not the Jordan River, but the Red Sea. And what does Moses do? You've probably seen the imagery. He takes his staff and he slams it on the ground and the waters instantly part into walls. What a beautiful moment. And so Joshua's going, oh, that's, a, that's, that's what's about to happen. That's what's about to go down. I'm gonna have this moment where I just slam my staff down and the walls instantly part. But that's not what happens. God works in a different way, which I think is so important because some of you have limited God working to the last way that he worked. You said that he's only gonna work now the way that he worked in the past, but what if God wants to do something different here today? The beautiful thing about God is that there's a myriad of ways that he can perform miracles, that there is no limit to his creativity, that just because he worked one way back then doesn't mean that he's gonna work in the same way now. And Joshua was open to the possibilities of what God wanted to do, that he wanted to do something as significant in him as he did in Moses, but he wanted to do it in a different way. Are you open to new ways? Are you open to new methods? Are you open to new things that God might want to do in you? Joshua was, and he gets to see a miracle because of it. Watch what happens. Verse 
I think it's like 14. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark of the Covenant had come as far as the Jordan, don't miss this, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest, okay? So the Jordan River, typically speaking, is about 500 feet wide, 500 feet wide. This is harvest time, it's barley harvest time, and so it's overflowing with water. At this time, the Jordan River would be a mile wide. For you non-distance math people, that's about 5,000 feet wide much wider than 500 feet. The waters are rushing, there are currents, it is dangerous. Stepping your foot in could cause you to get swept away into a current and be pulled downstream. This is the least strategic time to cross the Jordan River. It's not a good time. You ever felt like that? You ever been like, it's not a good time for me. Now it's not a good time for me. This is not a good time to cross the Jordan River. And you may be feeling right now today, this isn't a good time for a financial initiative. Tax season's coming up. Like why couldn't y'all have planned for bonus season, not tax season? This isn't a good time. This feels inopportune. But don't you know that it's when it feels inopportune that there's the opportunity for God to get even more glory? Don't you know when it's difficult, that's when God can show off the most? Don't you know that when you can't see a way that God gets to make a way and get all the glory? Because it's not your creativity, it's not your planning, it's not your initiative, it's not your strength, it's not your gifts, it's not your bank account, it's God. It's His goodness. And so I wonder if it's in the difficulty that God will grow us the most, if it's in the difficulty that the best stories get written, if it's when it's hard and doesn't make sense and you can't see a way, but you trust anyway that God does something that you'll never forget. It's an inopportune time. But as soon as they were dipped in the brink of the water, watch what happens next. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away. At Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan, and those flowing down toward the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off, and the people passed over opposite of Jericho. You can't miss this part. That arose in a heap very far away at Adam. Okay, so the priests step into the water with God, the Ark of the Covenant going before the people, leading the way. God always goes before us. He steps into the water. And as they step into the water, what happens is very far away in a city called Adam, 25 miles away from being across from Jericho, the waters begin to rise up in a heap. These walls begin to form 25 miles away. So they've stepped forward in obedience, but no miracle has started to happen, or so they think. They've stepped forward in faith, but the water isn't subsiding. But it actually is. It's just happening very far away. It's happening in a place called Adam, 25 miles away. It's a slow-moving miracle. It's a miracle that is in motion. You see, these priests, they, all that they have to do is take one step of faith and the miracle begins. They have to take one step of faith and then just stand there, plant their feet and firmly stand there and wait patiently for God to do something miraculously. And I think that there are some of you who maybe have taken a step forward in faith before and you shrink back because it didn't happen as quick as you thought that it was. It didn't happen overnight. It happened instantaneously. I don't know how long these people stood there. They may have stood there for minutes. They may have stood there for hours. They may have stood there all day long, waiting patiently, faithfully for God to come through. But what they didn't know and what they couldn't see is that underneath the surface, underneath the current, something was happening. The water was subsiding. And I'm here to tell you today that if you will just be faithful, if you'll just take a step of faith and you'll stand there long enough that the waters will start to subside, that fear will start to evaporate, that sin will start to be erased, that shame will start to leave. The waters are subsiding today, church, if we'll step forward in faith. And here's the other thing that I think is so incredible, that these heaps happen far away in cities that they're not in. Like, what would it have been like to be in the city of Adam and to see this massive wall of water just merge out of nowhere? Just a massive tsunami just chilling right in front of you. Like, that's a thing. <laughs> what would that have been like? I think the beauty of this miracle is that there are people in cities who you will never know and who you will never meet who will get to see God show off. They'll get to see the faithfulness of God because of your faith. They'll get to see the power of God because of your step forward. 
This is so good. This is what beyond is all about. Is that it's going to impact future generations, your grandkids. It's going to impact other cities, people and places that you'll never know. The stories that have yet to be written yet are limitless when we step forward in faith. Now watch what happens. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Now what you've got to know is that the Israelite people, we usually have this image of like maybe 30 people kind of standing there in our minds of who we're going to get to cross over, but there's somewhere between 800,000 and 2 million Jews at this time. And because of these priests' step of faith in standing in the water, two million people get to experience the faithfulness of God. Two million people get to experience the promise of God. Do you know that there's no telling, what, when you step forward in faith, there's no telling how many people are gonna get to walk behind you and walk past the presence of God and walk into the promise of God and experience the faithfulness of God all because of your one step of faith. They're gonna get to walk right by and see his majesty and behold, their gl- behold his glory. They never got to walk by the Ark of the Covenant, but this time they did because God made a way when there was no way. I wanna close with this story. I was in about the third grade and um, when you're in third grade, you wanna be like your dad, right? Every boy wants to be like their dad. I think that there's something like, I don't know, in breast milk that makes you just wanna be like your dad, okay? I don't know. And so there I was, wanted to be like my dad, but here's a problem is that my dad's an engineer and your boy's an athlete, okay? So like math and science, not my strong suit, counting numbers, the periodic table of elements, not my thing. But I wanted to be like my dad. And there was this big competition at school that was coming up called Science Olympiad. Anybody ever heard of it, Science Olympiad? It's like an Olympic tournament for nerds, okay? And I determined that I wanted to be in Science Olympiad. I wanted to join it. I wanted to be a part of it because I wanted to be like my dad. And uh, my parents were divorced at this time. And so I was living with my mom and um, this competition came up and I was working to try to make the Science Olympiad team. And so I worked, I went in early and stayed late and did tutoring and like lost all street cred with the girls so that I could be in Science Olympiad, right? And so it comes time to make the team and I make the team, I make the cut. And the big event of Science Olympiad is this tournament. And so, you know, we're getting close to the tournament. And the thing about this tournament is that your parent, one of your parents are supposed to go with you. And so obviously I wanted my dad to go with me because I wanted him to be proud of me. I wanted him to be there. Um, And um, the tournament was at Southern Polytechnic State University, my dad's alma mater. And so I thought it's this perfect situation. Like it's just this perfect fit. I'm going to get to show my dad, like all this hard work that I've done and all these steps forward that I've taken and you know, how, how I've become something that I never thought I could become and how I moved beyond just being, you know, an athlete to being an academic. Like I was so excited about it until the the week before Science Olympiad came and my dad told me he wasn't gonna be able to make it. And if I can be real, I was just crushed. I was like crushed, like devastated. And my mom is this incredible woman who did the most amazing job of being a mom and a dad so many times, playing basketball with me, showing up for me, teaching me to talk to girls, you name it. She did such a good job, but she couldn't come this day. She couldn't be there, right? She had my siblings and she couldn't be my dad. I, I, I need my dad there. And so I go to school that day. And before I even left, I told my mom, I don't think I'm gonna go. I don't think I'm gonna go on the trip. I think I'm just gonna sit it out. And she's like, no, you need to go. You've worked so hard. You've put in so much effort. You just, you need to go. We'll see. And so I go to school that day and I kind of, you know, go through the motions of school. And it comes about lunchtime where we hop on the bus and we're getting ready to go to the Science Olympiad tournament at Southern Polytechnic State University. And I'm sitting there on the bus, just kind of in that classic scene where my head is hung down and I'm defeated and I'm all by myself. When I hear a voice walk up and say, hey, is this seat taken? It was my dad. My dad had planned the whole time to come to be there. He just wanted to see whether or not I was gonna follow through on what I said I was gonna do. And I'm here to tell you today that there's a miracle that is already in motion, that your father is on the way, that he's gonna show up. He's gonna step into your situation. If you'll step forward in faith, he's gonna be there. He's got you. He's gonna make a way. He's gonna carve out a path. He's gonna make things that feel impossible become possible because that's what our God does. That's who our God is. He makes a way where there was no way. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed in this place,
I know that there's some of you who came into the room today feeling like there was no way for your life, feeling like you were stuck and there was no way forward. But today I want you to know that your dad is on his way. But there's a father in heaven who loves you more than you could ever possibly imagine beyond all compare. And today he's inviting you to take a step of faith, a step of surrender, a step into the waters of surrender. And so if you wanna do that today, if you want everything in your life to be different, all because of one step of faith, I just wanna invite you into this moment just to pray this prayer. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I'm tired of doing it on my own. I'm tired of wandering in the wilderness. Jesus, I'm tired of being stuck in my sin. Jesus, I believe your cross. I believe your resurrection and I need new life. And I'm stepping out in faith today to say yes to you, to surrender my life to you. And I'm believing you're gonna show up. If you prayed that prayer, we just wanna mark that moment with you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you wanna take this small step of faith that could make all the difference in the world today, then on the count of three, I'm just gonna invite you to raise your hand. This is your stepping into the Jordan River. You're stepping into the water and watching as God shows up, watching as he works miracles, watching as he moves you from the wilderness into wonder. One, two, three. Yeah, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Jesus, I thank you so much for your faithfulness. And I thank you that your promises are true. And I thank you for the heart of expectation that is rising up in this place. It's the kind of church I wanna be a part of. And God, I pray that we be a church who's full of faith that I don't know what our step is today, but I know that it's a step of faith. And I pray that we would take it fearlessly, that we take it confidently, that we take it for your glory. I pray these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen and amen. I invite you to stand as we worship together.